Animex is brought to you by Teesside University and our sponsors this year um, are, are helping us to bring this to you for free. Uh, Tees Valley Combined Authority and the Tees Valley Mayor um, are our main sponsors this, this year. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram and also check out our website animex.tees.ac.uk. Um, my name is Tim Brunton. I'm uh, a senior lecturer in animation, motion capture and um, um, production management. Um, I'm also the project manager for Animex and um, I'm standing in uh, today for Chris Wyatt who uh, is, uh, he, his role is to um, book all of the, uh, the speakers and liaise with the speakers. Um, and so he's done all the hard work in bringing the animation and visual effects speakers uh, to Animex this year. And um, I'm, I'm standing in for Chris because he unfortunately has COVID and uh, is um, confined to the house. Uh, and um, uh, so I, I, I get to introduce all these fantastic speakers. And our speaker uh, right now is um, Professor Stuart Samida. Um, Professor Samida is a paleontologist with the California State University in San Bernardino. He is extensively published with three books and over 70 journal articles specializing in the biological transformations that took place as backboned animals adapted to life on land. So why is Professor Samida here at Animex, you may be wondering? Well, he's a frequent anatomical consultant to the entertainment industry. He's worked on more than 60 feature films, including Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Lilo and Stitch, um, as well as the first and last Harry Potter films, How to Train Your Dragon, and he will be dropping into the DreamWorks um, talk later. Uh, so um, he's also served as a consultant to animators uh, to video games such as Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, Zootopia, uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom uh, as well. So uh, Stuart is a long time Animex contributor and it's an absolute pleasure to uh, to welcome him back and um, sorry I should have done that a little bit earlier so we could all see you Stuart um, but I'm going to hand over to you now. Thanks very much Tim. Uh, it, it is a great pleasure to uh, uh, come to you uh, from uh, California. Um, I would uh, uh, love to be there with you uh, in England uh, but uh, as, as Tim said COVID is, uh, is going to prevent us from doing that. But as Tim also said, I am a, a longtime uh, uh, supporter of Animex. I, uh, probably the first time I came to Animex, some of you were still in nappies, as they say. Um, and so um, uh, I've had the, uh, the good, good fortune of, of, of being in Teesside many times, at Middlesbrough many times, so much so that in fact, uh, my sons, who are um, uh, uh, big football fans, uh, all run around Southern California wearing um, Middlesbrough uh, kits. So yeah, it's a bit a bit unusual for for an uh, 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 an American, but there you are. Uh, I am uh, also uh, very keen to help support you, whether you're online or not. So that when uh, Chris and 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 Tim and Matt asked if I would be willing to participate, of course the answer is yes. Um, and so. Uh, some of you may have bumped into me in the past, uh, and so uh, I'll apologize right away if you've heard a couple of my jokes, uh, but um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do the best that I can. So, so as Tim said, I am a paleontologist. Why in the world would you want to hear from a paleontologist specifically or a biologist in general? Well, we do get to help on, on things like Jurassic films and Disney dinosaur films and so on. Uh, but... Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit more broadly today uh, because I am a professor of biology. And so I'm going to share my screen now. Let's make sure this works well. Uh, hopefully that's showing up for you. And, uh, it uh, is. Uh, we're in, uh, you need to swap displays. Uh, uh, right. Thanks very much. We're in.
Thanks, Ryan. Uh, hang on, folks. Sorry. I've got two screens is the problem. So, there we go. Not a bit better then. That's, that's perfect. And let me ask real quick if you can see my, my cursor. We can, yes, yeah. Great. So, so, uh, so there's my email address for those of you who are interested, and you can also hook up with me on LinkedIn later on if you're interested. Um, so, but yeah, if you look at the uh, um, the the little little intro there, um, I am from a department of biology, uh, and so despite that, I I'm a paleontologist that studies these kinds of of things, which is not a dinosaur, by the way. I tell everybody that it's not a dinosaur. It lived 60 million years before the earliest dinosaurs. But we will get to dinosaurs, promise, promise. Um, uh, most paleontologists don't get to teach paleontology at university. I teach human anatomy and physiology. I teach animal anatomy and evolution, comparative animal anatomy to future uh, veterinarians. I teach human anatomy to future doctors and nurses. So, so that means that I have to be much broader in what I do than uh, just talking about the fossil bones that I love to talk about. So, uh, so I'll introduce that concept by showing you the cover of a book that has been quite popular lately. Um, it's been popular in the States, at least. I can't, I can't say whether or not it's been so popular in the UK. Uh, but um, this, 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 this book has, has taken the, the States by storm because it has uh, suggested to people what a, what a brilliant idea it is that you shouldn't be so specialized. Well, well I can tell you this, um, uh, in, at least in the sciences, we've known this for, oh, about a half a billion years. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, as a paleontologist, I can tell you, then some of you probably know that over the course of the history of our planet, there have been some massive extinctions, the extinction that killed off most of the dinosaurs. There was an extinction before that, before the dinosaurs, and so on and so on. And the things that inevitably survive these massive disastrous events are not the specialists. They are the generals, the, the things that can eat anything, all right? That's one of the reasons humans are so uh, successful is because we can walk well and we can eat anything. We are much more generalized than we like to admit. We like to think we're special, but in fact, in terms of what we eat, we're quite generalized, which means that we can survive all sorts of difficult situations. So despite the fact that David Edstein thinks he's hit on a fabulous new idea, in, in the uh, biological sciences, we've known this in terms of how plants and animals survive for a very, very long time. The flip side of that is, uh, and I know that uh, many of the people who come to Animex in person uh, uh, will, will uh, uh, understand this. Many, many of you are, are probably students. Uh, not, not everybody. I understand we have, we have students to professionals uh, uh, in an event like this, but most university events do attract a lot of students. And, and I am a university professor, so I'm keen to speak to, to you particularly. Um, a lot of you know, and a lot of you have been listening to the recruiters that have come to talk to you at Animex uh, this year and in previous years, knowing that when you first come out of university and you have first come out of your degree, you're not going to get that one special job at Pixar or Disney or DNEG or wherever the case might be doing the one special thing that you'll do for the rest of your life. You know, you start out as a general dog spotty and you, you have to be able to do whatever it needs to be done and eventually you work your way up the ladder. So being a generalist when you first start out is also not a bad idea. Uh, it gives you the chance to get your foot in the door at many different places. Uh, so that is going to be another part of the theme I'd like to talk to you about today. Okay. I promise I'm not just going to talk about academics. Though. I promise I'll talk to you about some fun things in terms of our, uh, uh, our presentation and, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the projects in which we worked. Okay. So as Tim mentioned, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been around working with the industry for a good bit of time. Uh, the very, very first uh, film project I worked on was Beauty and the Beast which was not um, uh, the one that you, you saw only a few years ago, but the one that uh, came out um, decades and decades ago. <laughs> the second big project was Lion King, uh, and that taught me some very important lessons that I'm going to uh, bring, bring back to you today. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, but before I start all of that, let me tell you what the five most important generalized rules I've sort of learned uh, have been powerful and useful to me talking to people in the business like you. Okay. Uh, these are the rules that I like to talk about. Now, these are biological concepts, but these are the biological concepts, the scientific ideas that seem to resonate most with animators and visual effects artists. Not the only ones, there are many, many others, but these are the ones that work the most often for the most projects, okay? The first one, some of you have probably heard me say this, you are what you eat. Uh, what you eat determines all sorts of things about your body and how you move if you are a four-legged animal. Okay? That is probably the single most powerful tool I use and I, when I visit, visit animation and visual effects uh, studios the world over. Uh, then uh, we uh, can diverge into talking about people. And when you talk about people, doing the differences between males and females is critically important, and doing the differences between age, uh, uh, young and old is also very important. Uh, we could do uh, entire workshops on each of these, and we have at Animex over the years. I'm looking forward to coming back and, and visiting you in person one of these days, and we'll do one of these workshops for you, I promise. Okay. Um, beyond that, uh, as we like to say, size matters. And beyond that, whenever you create creatures, most of the creatures we create are made of things that we already know. We just have to know how to sew them together properly. So that means we need to know rules one through four. Those are all, except for the creature bit, pretty much things that I teach in my human and animal anatomy courses. So when is Samita gonna get to the actual animation and visual effects of, well, let's, let's go and, 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 and look at that very, very issue. So the, the very first project I ever worked on was Beauty and the Beast, and it was a creature construction uh, project, but I didn't work on the beast itself. I worked on the wolves and the horses. Uh, and that actually taught me a very, very important rule, and that was that it was important for artists to understand the difference between uh, an animal like a horse, which is a plant eater and how it moves, versus an animal like a wolf, which is a meat eater. And they move very, very differently because of what they eat. Okay? But the next big project was the Lion King. And if you look at the list of animals that we had to work with, uh, work with and work through, it was a rather uh, daunting list. Uh, for me as a, as a scientist, as a biologist, who taught comparative animal anatomy, it was a massive and exciting uh, project uh, to work on. And I actually had the good fortune of working at the Disney Studios in California and in Florida for, for months uh, on this, this project. It was, it was great. It was a fabulous learning experience, but it was not easy. And one of the reasons it wasn't easy was because of the diversity of animals with which we had to deal. So if you look at that list, it's like, oh my gosh, they're all over the map. But as a scientist, as a biologist, my first role was to break it into chunks that we could handle. We couldn't afford the time to spend days and weeks teaching about a warthog or a meerkat, or an elephant, or a zebra, or whatever. We had to work our training for the artists into their production time, their meetings, their working, their drawing, and everything else. So what we did is we broke it down into a smaller number of groups. Uh, and I can tell you that the very first rule that we used was the one that says, Plant eaters move one way and meat eaters move another way. And this is, and, and by the way, I understand that there are lots of vegetarians in the audience and this is not to diss any of the vegetarians, but I will tell you that, that meat is easier to digest than plants uh, because it has more roughage in it and it's also tougher on your teeth. But for animals, what it means is they have to eat a lot of material. Therefore, they're shaped differently. And when you're shaped differently, you move differently and all of those different kinds of things. So this is the first slide I ever showed to a, a, a bunch of, of uh, animators. And this was at Walt Disney Feature Animation uh, so long ago that I won't even give you the year because it'll, it'll give away just how old I am. Uh, but it does, it, it does convey the idea that animals that eat different things move differently. Right? 
And I won't go through all of that. That's, that's the stuff of an entire uh, uh, workshop, quite frankly. But, but there are some fun images that I can show you just to, to uh, go back uh, in history just a tiny bit. Uh, not only are their shapes different, uh, their flexibility is different. Uh, the flexibility of their backbone is different. I can tell you, for, for example, that animals that eat plants uh, versus animals that eat meat even uh, touch the ground in a different footfall pattern when they run. It's that significant. Okay? Uh, and so all of those different kinds of things impact an animal's shape and movement. Therefore, they impact what an animator has to do. And in addition to that, one of the interesting things about being a paleontologist is that we have a lot of the same uh, goals that you do. We are rebuilding things for people to see out of parts. You're using pencils and computers to build something that doesn't actually exist. We are looking at the bones or whatever the case might be to rebuild something that mostly doesn't exist anymore. So in fact, we have a lot in common. I love this particular set of images. I had nothing to do with the images that you're seeing slide left. Those are done by a wonderful artist, a fellow named Mauricio Anton. And Mauricio is really good at understanding skeletons and muscles and how they uh, contribute to the construction of an organism. And then fast forward uh, to a film like Bolt, where Jin Kim was doing, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, <clears throat> was doing the exact same thing. The exact same thing. Why do we care? Well, if you don't know where the bones are, you don't know where the joints are. And if you don't know where the muscle and skin and fat and fur are, you don't place those joints in the right places. So these are not only important to, to shape and design, they're important to rigging and all sorts of other things. So, so uh, if I haven't bored you to death already uh, for why you might want to be here, uh, there are vital data available in living animals that help us understand how creatures move. So what about this, this promise that we were actually gonna talk about, something that was on, on your televisions uh, not long ago. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, one of the really, really uh, remarkable projects I got to work on uh, in the past couple of years was uh, to uh, talk to the artists at Framestore uh, on, on the project that was a production by the BBC and then shown in the, in the States here on, on HBO uh, called His Dark Materials. And for those of you who, uh, who, who know this, the story, I'll apologize in advance, but for those of you who don't, His Dark Materials is a, uh, uh, a series uh, in which every character has an animal sort of alter ego or daemon. And, and so when Andrew Sheschel at, at Framestore asked me if I would be willing to talk to his artists about them, I said, sure. He said, well, I'm not, we're not gonna do a, a single uh, project specific animal. The most, the most famous animal in His Dark Materials, of course, is a polar bear. Okay. Uh, he says it's actually every every human has an animal, uh, you know, partner in this in this show. So there's going to be a lot of different animals. And I said, sure, 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 that'd be great. I've done I've done projects with with more than one animal before, uh, and so <laughs> and so I I signed on uh, sight unseen, and he sent me this list, which is which makes that list for the Lion King look downright small, doesn't it? And, and I said, wow. Uh, and in fact, um, I went to first go see uh, the folks at Framestore immediately after uh, one of my trips to Animex. Uh, and so uh, I looked at this list, and, and, and by the way, this was my organization of the list. He just sent me a list in, in alphabetical order. Okay? And what's really clear is that if I try to do a talk on each of these different animals, which I should be able to do as, an, as a person who teaches animal anatomy, we would be there listening to me for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we didn't have time to do that. We had to be efficient with our time. Uh, time is money, and producers and directors don't want you to spend all their time in artist development. They want you doing your art. So how, did, how were we able to break this down? Okay. Just like with The Lion King, we had to come up with groups of things that we could do. What we as scientists do is that we don't look for the individual differences between organisms first. That comes later. 
what you do first is you look for these similarities between particular groups. You talk about the similarities and then the differences take much less time at the end. Okay? So we do the generalist first, we do the specialist later. Okay? So I can be a generalist within, say, uh, terrestrial mammals, or I can be a generalist within the small terrestrial mammals versus the large ones. And that's pretty much what we did. Now, of course, you spend a bit more time on the more major characters. There was not as much uh, time spent on, say, insects as there was on the polar bear, because the polar bear was one of the most important characters in the project. Okay? So, of course, we will spend more time on that. But when we spend time on something like that, if we mention the things that it has in common with many of the characters, it saves us time. And if you save your producers and directors time, you save them money, they like you, and you have a job, okay? <laughs> or, or you have a more secure job. Okay. All right, so let's go to the examples of the carnivores. Remember what I said, you are what you eat. Carnivores eat meat mostly. Now, bears eat all sorts of things, but polar bears pretty much just eat meat. They like eating seals and whales, okay? So that was good. <clears throat> Okay. And then the smaller ones move differently because of their size, because size matters, but they're still carnivores, so they still have some of the features that all carnivores have, which is a very flexible backbone compared to that of plant eaters. So let's start with the polar bear, because he's obviously an important character, and he's a lot of fun. <clears throat> now, polar bears are unusually proportioned. Uh, they are bears. They are more like other bears than not, but they do have some features that are pretty particular. They have somewhat more streamlined bodies than do other bears because they swim. And anything that moves through the water or the air has to be sort of streamlined. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But in the meantime, one of the things we did with them is talked about how carnivores move. We talked about how flexible their backbone is. We talked about their footfall patterns. And after that, after we did all of that generalist stuff, then we could talk about some of the minor things that make bears more bear-like as opposed to the other carnivores. Now, here's one of the things that bears do. Bears can stand up. Most quadrupeds don't unless we force them. Okay? Bears can. They do it for a variety of reasons, mostly to look around to see if there's food or other uh, danger around. Uh, but one of the things you'll notice about every picture you see here is that when they stand up, their paws, their palms, turn towards their body. It has to do with the way their shoulders are attached to the side of their body. Our palms do something slightly different because our shoulders, our, 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 sh our shoulder blades are attached to the backs of our bodies. So our palms sort of hang facing our sides, whereas bears' palms face towards their bellies. And we'll find that that actually has some very particular uh, ways of influencing the way they move their hands when they walk. They sort of cup their hands up and inward when they bring their, their forepaw forward when they walk. And I'm gonna show you that in some of the uh, work that the artists did. You can see that really, really nicely on the, the two animals on um, slide right here. Uh, and so uh, you can see that they're standing up, but as they stand up, they turn their paws towards their bellies. <clears throat> now, of course, polar bears are special because they live in a very, very, very cold place. So they had very special paws, very furry, fuzzy paws, and we had to make sure we stuck that detail in on working on, on his dark materials. Now, before I show you some, some uh, material from the actual show, I want to uh, share a resource with you that I shared with the artist that everybody seems to like, okay? Uh, the animals in his dark materials were very, very photorealistic. When I work with, photo, with film studios, I, I, I get to span the gamut. I get to work on animals that are photorealistic, uh, projects like this or Life of Pi, things like that. I get to work on animals that are cartoony, but move realistically, like say Lion King or something like that. Uh, I get to work on very cartoony animals that have to have say real looks to them, like, like Scooby-Doo. Uh, and sometimes we just work on creatures. And that's, as they say, um, as, as Luke Skywalker would have said, that's a whole nother story. Okay? But let me share with you <clears throat> what we do with 
really, really real looking things. So here's an example of a skull of a polar bear. We had to make sure, of course, that the head shapes were correct. And you'll notice, if you look carefully, that there are some subtle differences between the sort of slightly rounder head of a grizzly bear versus the slightly more angular head of, of a polar bear. Can you even see that underneath all of the fur? Well, we certainly need to know where those joints are, okay, for example, because this animal talks and it bites, so we need to know where that jaw joint is, so knowing how the skull is constructed is in fact rather important. Now these are some beautiful photographs of skulls. These come from a fabulous resource. They come from uh, an, a, a source called Digimorph, you, you uh, can see the uh, uh, web, web address for that right there. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to share this with you. If some of you may already know about this. Digimorph, D-I-G-I-M-O-R-P-H dot O-R-G, is a resource that is uh, supported by uh, our United States Natural, National Science Foundation. Uh, uh, it, it is, um, uh, science is under attack in the United States right now because we have a, an idiot for a president. There, I said it. Um, uh, uh, and so he, he doesn't uh, understand or accept science, but some of us still do. And our National Science Foundation does. The National Science Foundation is a federal agency and because they have funded this project, not just for bears, but for animals of every kind, because it is taxpayer supported, it is free. It is free, 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 free. And because it's on the internet, it's free to the world. Okay, so if you want to see a polar bear skull, if you want to see a lion skull, if you want to see a human skull, a dinosaur skull, and anything skull, you can go to Digimorph and you can see digital renderings of these things. And if you look at these sectional images, they're really useful because you can figure out where joints are and all sorts of things. And here's the thing that's even more amazing about Digimorph. Not only can you look at these, all of these, these uh, movies, these are our quick time movies are freely downloadable and even better, the data from these are from CT scans. The data are freely downloadable. So you can download the data. If you have a 3D printer, you can have your own polar bear skull or whatever. It's a fantastic resource. And I have recommended this to artists the world over uh, and, it, and uh, I encourage you to take advantage of it. All right, so we now know a lot more about the inside of how um, a polar bear looks. We can look at its skull and we can look at its skeleton. And once we know that skeleton, we can rig it accurately. Uh, we can put the joints in the right place. And let me tell you, that is probably the thing that I do more than anything else anymore. Uh, I used to talk about surface anatomy a lot. I still do some but I spend way more time on skeletons now because when you do digital characters, you must rig them correctly. And you can't rig them correctly if you don't know where their joints are. And people frequently put the joints too close to the surface because they forget that the joints are covered by meat, which are covered by fat, which are covered by skin, which are covered by fur. Okay? Joints are not as close to the surface as people often think. Okay. Uh, so now we did build a polar bear skull that was, excuse me, a polar bear skull that was a little exaggerated for this film, uh, this set of films. Uh, if you look at the position of the shoulder blade and this particular skeleton of a polar bear, and you look at it in the actual um, uh, character from the film, you'll notice that the shoulder blades are a little too high and a little too large little bit of artistic license there. Okay? But not only do we need to know how that skeleton works, we need to know where the meat is and we need to, and this is really important, we need to know that the superficial to that meat is gonna be fat and skin and fur, which means that those joints have to be very, very carefully placed. That this is not the entire animal, okay? That's not the entire animal. Okay? There's still more superficial to that. Right. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip here of this animal walking, and I'd like you to watch its hands and notice how it turns its hands uh, immediately towards the inside 
as it walks, because that is something that bears do very, very particularly. Uh, and, and, and it was one of the things that we made sure we did when we had these polar bears walking. You'll notice that the foot does not do the same thing that the hand does. And that's one of the things that gives us some of that real sort of realistic behavior that we're looking for in one of these animals. Okay. Now, of course, uh, I did mention you are what you eat. Okay, uh, carnivores do move differently from herbivores. They have a more flexible backbone. Okay, the reason you can ride a horse is because it eats plants. It's got a stiff backbone to hold up all those guts that have to digest all those plants. Okay, so, so even though bears are big of body, they do eat meat, okay, and they do therefore have a more flexible backbone. And we have to make sure that we show that back flexibility when these animals move. Now, of course, uh, for the services of the, of the story, they're gonna do more than just walk and run and swim. These animals have to act, they have to speak, and of course, in his dark materials, they have to fight. Uh, I can tell you one of the most fun things I ever did in Animex ever was the uh, a workshop on the anatomy of a fight scene because I've done martial arts since I was a kid. Uh, so I will tell you that I'm super, super, super happy that if you watch this next clip, uh, you'll notice, uh, for those of you who've done some martial arts, a little bit of a judo throw uh, where, he, uh, where the, uh, one of the bears trips the other one over its leg. <laughs> The importance of skeletons. So that's a big carnivore. There were small carnivores as well. They also have flexible bodies. Now, size does matter. The smaller you are, the more flexible you can be. Okay. Uh, and each uh, individual human character, of course, had their animal daemon. And one of the uh, uh, animal daemons was an Arctic fox. Uh, this demonstrates not an anatomical problem. This demonstrates a lighting problem. Uh, and I am not a lighter, but I will tell you uh, that uh, one of the things that the artist had to deal with with a character like this is if you put an animal like this against the snow, it's hard to see. Well, that's the whole point of an Arctic fox in real life. But on television, of course, you need to do something a little bit different. We ran into the same uh, problem. Uh, uh, imagine uh, an animal like Dory from Finding Nemo, a blue fish against blue water. So it means that color theory and lighting become very, very important. But shape is important to lighters. So uh, there's intersection in, in what our interests happen to be. Uh, one of the things I'd like you to notice in these next couple of clips are that these are initial uh, movement studies uh, that were done for some of the characters for uh, dark materials. And I'd like you to notice why these artists who did these movement studies are pros, not just because of the movement, but I'll tell you why I think so after you take a look. So here's our Arctic fox. So they did a movement study. And that, and that animal had to sort of take a quick trot out onto the scene and, and move across. But this artist was smart. This artist knows that a simple walk cycle is important, but boring. So what does this animal do? This animal does demonstrate his, his uh, locomotor cycle, but he stops, he takes a look at something, he looks around. There's a tiny bit of acting in that. Even though this is just a test, there is acting in that. And when you do your, your portfolios, when you show people what you're capable of doing, if you are not just showing them you know, mechanics and, and, uh, and, and step cycles, but you know how to act, that means you are broader. You are more of a generalist. One of the one of the people that has um, uh, come to Animex many many times um, is uh, are, are people who, who teach us about acting. Okay, uh, so there's an example of a locomotor step cycle with a little bit of acting. Excellent point. Okay, other small carnivores included uh, what we call mustelids. Mustelids includes things like weasels and martens and so on. And one of the things that's remarkable about them is they're extremely long body, but they run like a carnivore. They have a flexible backbone, and that's where we start with the generalist before we go to the specialized. Okay? Once we do that, then we can take the features that are particular to 
weasels and martens themselves particularly. And that feature, of course, um, is that they have an extremely flexible backbone. However, the flexibility in their backbone <clears throat> is a little farther back than it is in, say, a polar bear or lion because they are so elongated of body. Once we understand that, we can do some of the details. We can look at the shape of their, their bones, their muscles, their skin, and their fur, and their locomotion, and then we do another test. Okay. So here is a, an animal that is definitely acting for us. Okay. Now, one of the things that makes it tough is that these had to be photorealistic animals. So we, they were chosen in part because different animal shapes have different ways of moving, slightly at least. And when you move differently, you act differently. And when you act differently, that's acting, okay. which helps to distinguish the different daemons for the different people. Now, that means that if you're going to work on a project like this, not only do you need to know how to animate or how to rig or something like that, you need to know about acting. Or why do you need to know about acting if you're a rigger? Well, because you have to create something that can act the proper way. So it helps to have a broad base of experience. I need to move on because uh, we're almost out of time and we're going to cut off at 10. Uh, small terrestrial mammals are very flexible. They're very, very flexible. Uh, and so, uh, and, and they do violate some of the rules because they're so small. Uh, my favorite example is a rabbit. Now, now I don't have time to give you all the details on rabbits. The first rabbit I ever worked on was a rabbit in Lone Ranger. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the very first thing that they, the uh, Lone Ranger uh, folks at ILM asked me is, wait a minute, you told me that in that generalist lecture that plant eaters move one way and meat eaters move another way, but rabbits run like dogs. And don't dogs eat meat? Well, yeah, they do. And here's the thing, rabbits are the exception to the rule. They run like a carnivore and there is a good biological reason that is so funny and gross that I don't have time to tell you that now. If we have time for questions at the end, someone remind me and I'll tell you why rabbits run like dogs. But there are different kinds of rabbits. There are snowshoe hares and there are little uh, cottontail bunnies. We had to make sure that we knew the differences between those. That's really important because otherwise they don't look correct. I do have my big five rules. You are what you eat, size matters, male and female matters, age matters, and creatures. Students and professionals alike ask me, what's the toughest thing that you ever have to work on? And the answer is instantly, things that fly. Flying things are really, really tough. <clears throat> and you're going to hear about some of the flying things from the uh, DreamWorks folks today uh, at uh, 7 o'clock your time, uh, including dragons. Uh, and I'll pop in to, uh, to help a little bit. And I can tell you this. We could talk about flying things for weeks. And in fact, that's what they did at DreamWorks on dragons uh, and a variety of other projects. They literally built something called flight school. But we had to go through that quickly for dark materials because there are birds in the, in, the, in the project. And here's the thing, I could do a workshop for a day at Animex or I could do what we did at DreamWorks and we could talk about this for weeks and weeks and months and months. But I'll tell you this much, if you move through the air or if you're a fish moving through the water, you must be torpedo shaped. You must have a, a body that can slip through a viscous medium. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the air or you're in the water, it's pretty much the same rule. Beyond that, things with wings are really complicated. <laughs> They're really complicated. But one thing all, all bird wings do is they fold the same way. So, talking about birds might feel like a, a specialist thing, which it is. But you can generalize the wings of all birds by showing how they fold. Okay? There is some consistency in what they do. So these are some of the examples of the things that we've done at both DreamWorks and uh, at, at uh, Framestore for his dark materials. Okay. I don't have time to tell you all of those details, but I can tell you this, everything that flies, everything that flies has to obey the laws of physics. Otherwise they look cruddy, okay? 
Um, I, I, Tim told me no swearing. <laughs> so, so I didn't say they all look crappy. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> uh, look, I figure if I can say it on Rick and Morty or Futurama, I, I can say it to you, right? Uh, so there are, the point of this is that we did spend time with the, uh, the frame store folk and trying to make sure they understood the body constraints of things that fly. And, and we did. And I promise you that uh, uh, next time I get to see you in person, uh, we'll, we'll spend more time on this, okay? Uh, so flight is tough, flight is tough. But of course, all of these animals can talk, which means we also have to understand how to put human facial emotions onto other animals' head shapes which is a hybrid creature uh, a concept. We have to uh, make things that don't usually do certain things look natural. Now, do animals talk? N not in English, but on film they do. And I know that that's not real, but if they did, that's our, that, that is the question. If they did, how would they do it? And can we make it look natural? Well, part of the key to making facial communication on an animal look natural is to get eyes that look right. Now, it doesn't mean giving them whites of their eyes so they look like a human being like they did in those, those Planet of the Apes movies, which I gotta tell you, make me crazy, okay? But can you take an animal's eye and make it move and act the way a human eyes would move and act? That was more important, okay? And of course, a little bit of uh, body language. So when we did that, it suddenly made animals that look like animals relate facially to people. So you can see curiosity in this character's face, not only because of his eyes, but by the way he cocks his head back and forth, by the way he moves his entire body. And the artist who did this test, by the way, was clearly having some fun because you notice that not only did he put in the golden monkey, he put in a snake, which flicks its tongue periodically, and one of the insects that we had to work on as well. So this particular artist not only did some very impressive animation, but also had to know a tiny bit about bugs and a tiny bit about snakes, which meant that this particular artist's education, uh, at least, or training had to be a little bit broader a little bit less specialized. <clears throat> now, so there are some examples of how we did the, the generalist specialist sort of um, uh, range of things uh, in a project like His Dark Materials. Now, there have been many other projects uh, over the course of my career where we've had to deal with, with more than one animal. Sometimes it's very project specific. Uh, you know, do me an elephant, do me a lion, you know, or something like that. Uh, do me a gorilla. But sometimes we have to look at many different things. When we looked at this particular project, there were all sorts of things. And you all heard, um, for those of you who were here earlier um, at four o'clock your time, Amy Blackwell called me up when I was in the UK and said, hey, by the way, we're, we're working on this dinosaur film. <laughs> Would you come and talk about dinosaurs? And I'm like, sure, which one? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of them. Can we talk about all of them? No but we can talk about groups. So we can talk about what I, as a paleontologist, love talking about, the big major types of dinosaur groups. And for those of you who know a little bit of German, Bauplan, of course, you know, means body plan. And there are body plans that we see in different groups of dinosaurs. Some of them are lightly built uh, bipeds. Others of them are heavily built quadrupeds. Some of them are massively built quadrupeds. Some of them are massively built bipeds. Each of those things has their own particular features and their own types of movement. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different kinds of dinosaurs. We didn't have thousands and thousands of hours and days. And, and quite frankly, the characters in the Jurassic uh, films were already defined. We know there's going to be a T-Rex. We know there's going to be small raptors. We know there's going to be large herbivores. Yeah, we throw a few new ones in here and there. Uh, let's throw in a Mosasaur this time, or whatever the case might be. By the way, Mosasaurs aren't dinosaurs. They're aquatic reptiles. But there you are. Okay. Uh, so do we have time to do every single species of dinosaur? 
No. Can we do the big groups to help the artists who maybe haven't worked on a Jurassic film before get up to speed with those who have? Yes, we can. And we can do it by looking for generalized patterns that cut across a broad group of organisms. And finally, my last example I'll give you <clears throat> is from another Jurassic project. Now, of course, the Jurassic projects have always been something associated with uh, uh, Universal and with the Industrial Light and Magic uh, digital effects artists. Uh, it's one of their, their, their greatest legacies, in fact. Uh, and uh, coming this uh, fall to Netflix is the children, well, the young people's um, uh, television spinoff called Camp Cretaceous. Camp Cretaceous is on a television budget, but the dinosaurs have to look like Jurassic World dinosaurs. And once again, we had a big cast uh, that we had to get through rather quickly. So instead of doing each one, one at a time, we break them into groups <clears throat> so that we can understand big groups as quickly as possible. So looking for overall pattern in groups, being a generalist, is a good thing. The recruiters will tell you your first job, you might not get to do your favorite thing. You have to be able to do many things to get your foot in the door in many cases, not always, but in many cases. So that's the uh, lesson I wanted to uh, bring to you. Not only for me as a scientist, must I be a generalist to do my job, but for many of you, being a generalist will give you the opportunity to do more things as you eventually make your way towards, uh, towards your, your ultimate goals. Now we're almost out of time. Uh, and so what I'd like to leave you with this is this. I know we have a grand mixture of, of folk, both, both uh, student and professional uh, at Animex. So I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, in England right now. Uh, so from sunny Southern California to a, a picture of a sunny Teesside uh, University, uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, and I'd like to leave you with this message. Uh, I am a scientist, but I'm also a parent. Uh, this is a caricature of my son uh, many, many years ago uh, as we worked on, on the film Brother Bear. That's what he looked like as a baby. And this is what his younger brother looked like as a baby as he helped me dig up some dinosaurs. And this is what they look like now, or, or close to it. They're getting bigger. Here's the thing. The reason we're virtual right now is because 2020 has been an unusual year. Um, a very, very unusual year. Uh, and we're all doing our best. I can tell you that youngsters like these kids and like many of you students are doing rather better than some of us old folk because you're used to being digital, you're used to being online. So that's a good thing, remain adaptable. In the meantime, as you move from your student ships to your jobs, please remember for me as a scientist and a parent, science is important. Don't listen to the politicians like my dumbass president who tries to say it's not. You use science as a tool. You're all very computer savvy and I'm giving you examples of how science can help you in your jobs. More importantly to me than even that, is that you all are building the world in which these kids are growing up. You are helping to fix the world that my generation has messed up. It is my privilege to help you do that, but we can fix it only if you all do your jobs and do them well. So I know that sometimes it's going to be tough. I know that sometimes it's going to be crunch time and it's going to be exhausting. But please remember, for the sake of these folks who are going to be your audience, that you have a massive, massive impact. I can teach future doctors and impact thousands of people. I can teach a course in dinosaurs and impact a few. The projects, the video games, the movies, the films, the television shows you work on are going to reach billions of people. That's huge. So, you get to carry a very important torch, and I encourage you to use every tool at your disposal, and it is my great um, 
uh, honor to be one of those tools. So thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I know that I haven't left much time for questions, but I will answer questions as quickly as I can. I do want to thank everybody at Framestore who very, very graciously gave me the uh, video material for today's talk. And of course, uh, thank you to the folks at Animex, uh, Chris, Tim, and Matt, and the person who first invited me to Animex many years ago, also named Chris, and the folks uh, who helped me with the examples I gave you today. Uh, thank you so very, very much, and I look forward to seeing uh, some of you live and in person again very, very soon. Thank you, Stuart. Um, that was a, a really fascinating talk. Um, we had a lot of questions. Uh, at least 75% of those questions uh, was about um, how the... Um, uh, why does a rabbit run like a meat eater? So uh, we'll we'll start with that. Okay. Oh, okay. maybe we should end with that actually, because uh, they'll all disappear once they've heard the answer. Uh, okay. Uh, so, um, what fantasy creature do you find most often has inaccurate anatomy? Okay. Um, the things that 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 uh, uh, things that fly are particularly difficult. I mentioned whether real or or fantasy. Uh, and the thing about flight is this: um, when you fly, you have to have a really stable platform from which the wings work. And yeah. so you can't fly with your body bending all over the place. And we like to do that because it looks cool, but it rarely works and also uh and and you can see this in things like game of thrones you can see it in avatar and so on and so forth everybody thinks that when you fly you take off with your wings you don't you take off by jumping first and then your wings kick in whether you're a dragon or a sparrow or a pigeon and so that is one of the things that that, that we work really hard on, on on how to train your dragon for example uh you're going to hear from um uh, sean sexton later today and the work that he did with um simon Otto. and and so getting flying things right is one of the toughest things whether fantasy or real yeah cool thank you um how do you um how do you design a believable dragon? So it's kind of a, a flying creature as well? That, that, that's a great question. That's a great question. And when I first worked on the first dragon's film, they said, so do you know anything about dra the anatomy of dragons? I was like, uh, no, never dissected one. But the answer is, well, of course we do, because most creatures are based on things that we already know. Uh, so all of the dragon's flight mechanics, not necessarily their shapes and their faces, but their flight mechanics, were essentially based on either pterodactyls, birds, uh, or bats. And we know a lot about those things. So if we can make their wings and bodies work like those creatures, then no one worries about how they're moving. And then you can advance the story because people aren't looking at it. They're going, that doesn't look right. That seems weird. You don't want the audience worrying about that. And so we go to the real thing as our model for movement. And just like in, in Spirit, which is a horsey movie where you had a cartoony look, they still moved like horses, so yeah. you bought into the story. Similar, similar strategy. Yeah, cool. Uh, a, a good question here um, from Anonymous. Uh, how do you design creatures who in real life are small but are enlarged in a fictional universe, like giant spiders? Um, okay, well, how um, do you do it vice versa, like small? Yeah, animals? so, so it's, it's, the, the trick is, is that when things are really, really big, they can't move as quickly. Uh, because otherwise they break. So one of the things you do is you change the speed at which they move. Uh, and, and so for example, an elephant is big. It's so big, it cannot run. It can only walk quickly. So we impose those kinds of physical rules on something that wouldn't normally have a rule like that. And so it's not so much an anatomical thing, but it's more of a biomechanical behavioral uh, animation rule uh, that you, you would, if it becomes really, really big, it can't dance around the way it would have when it was small. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, Stuart, um, the, in a one minute, why do rabbits run like dogs? Okay, here, here it is. Okay, uh, meat is easy to digest. Plants are difficult to digest because they have roughage around them. If you remember your, your yeah. grade school, they got things like, called cell walls because and cell walls are tough to digest. So they have long, 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 long digestive tracts and carnivores can run in a bendy way because their digestive tracts are short. How can a plant eater do that? Here's why. 
Rabbits have a short digestive tract, so they can run bendy because they eat their own poo. <laughs> okay, they're what's called coprophages. Coprophage, and so they eat it, they pass it once, they eat it again, so they digest it twice, so they can have a shorter digestive tract, which lets them run like a dog. Wow. So well, you are you what you eat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Um, uh, I think everybody um, uh, really enjoyed that uh, talk. Um, there's uh, a lot of positive feedback. Um, right. People loved it. And uh, overall, people are just saying thank you so much. Um, it's and, my pleasure. And thank you from us. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you again uh, in the DreamWorks talk in an hour's time. Sounds good. I'll look forward to that as well. All Take right. care, everybody. Thanks. Speak to you soon.